So chemicals are all around us, and chemistry is uh, all around us. There are hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions taking place in our body every minute of every day. Our food is made of chemicals. Everything around us is made of chemicals. And there are many, many chemical reactions taking place all around the world. And indeed, some of the chemical reactions cross boundaries. Did you know that the same chemical reaction that makes your bread crusty and brown can also be used to give you a fake suntan in the winter? Many of the chemicals that are around us are very, very simple, but some of them are very, very complex. Many of them are naturally occurring, but some of them are made by chemists with a particular application in mind. So if chemists are going to go about making molecules, they need a toolkit to use. I think my interest in chemistry goes back to being a kid. I always used to play with Lego blocks. And I found that you could take the Lego blocks and you could put them together in all sorts of different ways to make amazing architectures. And really, chemistry is very much like that. We have a toolkit and we put pieces of our molecules together to make new and improved molecules. Sometimes we might take a naturally occurring molecule and find a way to make that in the lab. Take, for example, marine sponges that are found at the bottom of the ocean. So quite often you can find that chemicals inside these sponges are very good for things like anti-cancer treatments. But it's impractical to go down to the bottom of the sea and harvest lots and lots of these, uh, uh, th these sponges and extract the chemicals from them. Instead, what you want to be able to do is make these chemicals in your laboratory. So old ways of making chemicals quite often involved quite a lot of waste along the way. As we move now into the modern era, what we're trying to do is develop cleaner, greener ways to make our molecule. And there's a whole area of chemistry called green chemistry. In this area, we're trying to find ways of, of making our molecules faster, cleaner, and easier than previous routes had used. So we need some metrics to be able to do this. And we all know what the economy is, but chemists have what we call the atom economy. That's where we try and work out how many atoms that are in our starting materials end up in the products. And the more that we have in the products, the better, the closer we get to a 100% atom economy. Another thing that we learn as kids is that prevention's better than cure. My mum always told me that if I ate my vegetables, I wouldn't have to go to the doctor because I'd never get sick. And she was right, I still eat a lot of vegetables at home. But we can use that same prevention is better than cure rule in the laboratory. If we can prevent causing waste, then we don't have to clean it up afterwards. So if we can find cleaner ways to make our molecules, then that can greatly streamline our process. One of the things that we do in our laboratory is we use metals as catalysts. What we can do is we can put the, a bit of metal into our reaction, and that can make it go much, much faster and drive us from our starting materials through to our products. And in our laboratory, we've developed a range of these so-called metal-catalyzed reactions. Many of those, we actually use water as the solvent in which we do our reactions. Water is often better than toxic organic solvents that you have to get rid of and burn at the end. Using water, which is nature's solvent, we can quite often do some very, very interesting chemistry. One of the things that I love to do is go home after a day in the lab and do some cookery. I actually do all the cooking at, at home. I think cookery is very much like chemistry. The advantage of cookery is that at the end of your process, you can actually eat your product. Whereas in the lab, most often you don't want to do that. But we use some of the technology that we find in the kitchen in our laboratory. One example is the using, using microwave ovens to do chemistry. We all know that at home, the microwave is a quick way to heat things up. And microwaves came into, popular, uh, into the, 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 the kitchen in the early 50s, but then, since then, have really blossomed. And chemists are now using that same technology to make their molecules in the laboratory. We don't use domestic microwaves, the type of microwave you have at home. We use microwaves that are designed for doing preparative chemistry. 
So here at UConn, most of the chemistry that we do, we do on a relatively small scale, just to prove that we can do it and make a few milligrams, a small amount of our material. But if you go to a large company and say, I've got this new chemistry and I can make a few milligrams of material, they'll laugh at you and say, come back when you can start to make significant quantities of material. So scaling up reactions, taking them from a small scale to a larger scale, is also something that we're involved in here at UConn. And when you go from small scale to large scale, some of these metrics of green chemistry become increasingly important. And as we're going into the summer, I just want to quickly share with you one of my favorite mes uh, uh, recipes for, for a marinade. What I do is I take some balsamic vinegar, I take some herbs, roughly chop them, put them into my pot with my balsamic vinegar, and I add a little olive oil. Then I'll take my meat, my fish, and my veg, and marinate those, uh, preferably overnight. Next day, I'll fire up the grill, put my meat, my fish, my veg onto the grill, and cook a lovely dinner for my wife and I. At the end of the evening, I'll have my pot, which had a little bit of marinade left over in it. I just tip that down the drain and, and wash it away. But what happens if I now go from just cooking for my wife and I to, say, opening a restaurant that serves two, three hundred people a night? Well, then I go from a little bit of marinade that I can throw away to a really big problem. I'm going to have a lot of balsamic vinegar. And on a large scale, balsamic vinegar is an acid. So I had to dispose of that appropriately. I've got all those herbs on a large scale. I've got a lot of solid waste I've got to get rid of at the end of the night. And I've got the olive oil. And olive oil is really just a flammable organic solvent on a large scale. So I've got a real issue on my hands. So as we go from the small scale to the large scale, so making our chemistry cleaner and greener becomes increasingly important. So more recently, we've become interested in taming one of the most reactive elements in the periodic table, and that's fluorine. Fluorine is found in about 20% of the pharmaceuticals today. But the incorporation of fluorine atoms into organic molecules is actually a major challenge for preparative chemists. We've become very interested in taking this challenge on and taking fluorine, that most reactive element of the periodic table, and trying to find ways to selectively incorporate fluorine atoms into molecules. And this has taken us into another interesting area of cleaner, greener chemistry. So quite often to make reactions go, you use so-called oxidants. We would add our oxidant to our starting material to make our product. And at the end, we've got to extract that oxidant out of our product mixture, and quite often we just throw it away. And quite often, these oxidants are either metal compounds, which lead to a lot of metal waste, or else are, are very, very dangerous to handle. In our laboratory, we've been using a, an environmentally benign oxidizing agent to do a wide range of chemistry, including this incorporation of fluorine. With this oxidant, we can put it into the reaction mixture. It contains no metals. We do our chemistry, and at the end, it just precipitates or falls out of solution, and we can just extract it, and then we can recycle it, and we can use it again. So this is allowing us now to get into a new area of cleaner, greener chemistry. Another thing that chemists are trying to do is mimic nature. Nature's got many, many years on us uh, humble chemists. One of the things that we all know is that to make a loaf of bread, you've got to have it rise. You've got to put your yeast in there. So yeast is really just an enzyme. It's a, it's, it's bio, it's a biological material that allows us to do a chemical reaction very easily. It's like those metal catalysts I told you about. Chemists are now trying to use these enzymes to do chemistry very, very selectively. And it turns out that you can do this really nicely. Unlike the microwave reactions, which we have to heat to very high temperature, these enzymes work best at around body temperature. So we don't have to heat a reaction if we're using an enzyme. So we can put our enzyme into our reaction, and we can do our chemistry using that. Again, a cleaner, greener way of making our compounds. So I hope I've shown you that we can take some of the principles that we know and use in the kitchen at home and take those into the laboratory. And I can take my fascination with Lego bricks and take that now into the laboratory and look at how we can make fascinating new and exciting molecules. And chemists really are focused on trying to derive new, cleaner, 
greener ways to make their molecules. Whenever people think of chemistry, they quite often think of, of, of people in lab coats blowing stuff up and making a lot of mess and a lot of waste. But we couldn't be further from the truth. We can't live without chemistry, and chemistry is essential to every part of our life. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and talk to you today.